as your word is preached upon. May your spirit open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to receive the message that you have for each of us. Use these words for your purposes and yours alone. Lord, empty me of me and fill me with thee. Amen. I'm sure you noticed the rousing rendition at the beginning of service of when the saints go marching in. Thank you, Dennis. When I say the word saint, what comes, who comes to mind for you? Do you think of someone who is no longer physically present, who has died, who has gone on to glory? Or maybe you think of someone venerated and honored by the church, church with a big C. While United Methodists do not have official saints, we do remember those who have served the church and lived out their faith boldly and consistently. We're grateful for their kingdom work in the church and in our lives. We remember the person or people in our life who shared love with us so generously and compassionately that there was no doubt that they had Jesus in them, that they were Jesus with skin on. But the truth is, we church folk are called to have a little different understanding of saints, of the word saint. Romans 1, 7 says, Paul writes, to all who are loved by God and called to be saints. And 1 Corinthians 2.2 2 says, To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be saints, grace to you. And Ephesians 1.1 1, 1 says, to the saints who are in Ephesus, the faithful in Jesus Christ, grace to you. And the letters of Philippians and the Colossians begin the exact same way, to the saints. Now, we know that the Apostle Paul was not writing letters to dead people. So the word saints must have a different meaning. And listening to how Paul addressed his letters to the first century, to the followers of Jesus, to the faithful in Jesus, to the sanctified in Jesus, you start to get the idea that there's more to being a saint than being deceased. In other words, a saint is one who is sanctified by God, who is a person whom the Holy Spirit is making holy. And if you look up the word sanctified, the definition is made holy by God. Or to put it more simply, a saint is someone in whom God is working. A person is made a saint by the love and the grace of the triune God. Whether they are first century followers of Jesus or someone that we remember today in our own lives, Reverend James Howe writes in his book, Servants, Misfits, and Martyrs. He says this, These friends of God are not superhuman. 
Saints do not possess an extra layer of muscle. They are not taller. They do not sport superior IQs. They're not richer, and their parents are not more clever than yours or mine. They have no bat-like perception that enables them to fly in the dark. They are flesh and blood, just like you and me. No stronger, no more intelligent. And that is not the point, he says. They simply offer themselves to God, knowing that they are not the elite and fully cognizant that they are inadequate to the task, and that their own abilities are limited and fallible. So what makes someone a saint? An extraordinary God who takes the ordinary, the likes of you and me, and does God's work. A saint is a saint because of what God is doing in their lives, in our lives, amidst our failings, our doubts, our shortcomings, our lack of faith. That's on our worst days. On our best days, we recognize that God is at work in us. And we claim being a follower of Jesus Christ. A saint is a sinner, and a sinner is a saint. Pastor and author Leonard Sweet started his sermons with this. Good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. We're all here. And all that we are is here a good reminder. So when you think about saints and those in your life, be honest about who they really are. A beloved child of God in need of God's grace. Ordinary folks sustained, sanctified by an extraordinary, extraordinary God. Reverend Nadia Bowles Weber, in her book, Accidental Saints, Finding God in All the Wrong People, writes this. It has been my experience that what makes us saints of God is not our ability to be saintly, but rather God's ability to work through sinners. The word saints is always conferred, never earned. Or as St. Paul in Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you to will and work for God's pleasure. I've come to realize, she says, that all the saints that I've known have stumbled into redemption like they were looking for something else at the time. <clears throat> Like people who have a drinking problem and manage to get sober and help others do the same. People who are as kind as they are hostile. What we celebrate in the saints is not their piety or perfection, but the fact that we believe in a God who gets redemptive and holy things done in this world through, of all things, human beings, all of whom are flawed. All of whom are flawed. What then are we to do? Well, some people question Jesus about the exact same thing. Matthew 22, verses 34 through 39 When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, an expert in the law, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, I wonder if that point, when Jesus gets this question, I just wonder how he reacted. 
I wonder if it was like, oh. Or if it was like, hmm, let me think about that. Or if it was just a pause and a smile and a constant quick answer. Well, let me tell you. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is one of the temple showdowns that are captured in the Gospels. One commentator offers this. This passage presents the third in a series of confrontations between Jesus and his challengers. Here in Matthew, the Pharisees notice the Sadducees' failure to entrap Jesus, and they regroup. Rather than trying to ensnare him with a no-win question, they now approach Jesus with an open-ended question. Which commandment in the law is the greatest? While this may appear to be innocent, Matthew tells us that the Pharisees did intend to test him. They are attempting to trick him into a misstep by encouraging him to engage in an unwise topic. Once again, how much can this carpenter's son really know? That question that they asked immediately poses a theological problem for Jesus. How can one law be greater than the other? See, the laws were not hierarchical, with one law being more important than the other. If you broke one law, you broke all the laws. There wasn't greater laws or lesser laws. It was all the law. And yet, and yet Jesus, being the good Jew that he is, he knows this. And he makes a bold statement that indeed there is one greatest commandment. And then, if that's not enough, he takes another command and puts right beside it as equal to. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. And a second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. First, in answering the question, Jesus quotes part of the law known as the Shema, the most prominent prayer in Jewish tradition. It's Deuteronomy 6.5, if you want to look it up. The Shema can well be called the cornerstone of the Jewish faith and practice. Its importance to Judaism cannot be overstated. While often recited as a prayer, fundamentally the Shema is a statement of who God is because it starts... The Lord your God is one. Therefore, love the Lord your God with all of your being. Dr. Lance Pate, professor at Bright Divinity School, cautions us, though, with these familiar words that we've heard. He says this, too often in the church, love is used as an excuse to take the path of least resistance instead of the path of excellence. When telling the truth would be uncomfortable, we practice equivocation and call it love. How frequently love is code for smiling at biblical illiteracy and winking at theological incompetence. 
Our definition of love is suspiciously easy on us and for us. But this is not the definition of love that Jesus is working with in Matthew. The Jesus we see in the stories thinks that to love God with the whole self, with all of our heart and our mind and our soul, is demanding and risky. Following the path of love leads Jesus to jump into debates and conflicts with his whole self. Love leads Jesus into all kinds of situations that are uncomfortable, that are not just uncomfortable, but dangerous. Eventually, love like this gets him killed. See, when you get involved with Jesus and the type of love that Jesus models, it can be messy. It can be uncomfortable. It can be inconvenient. It can even be unpopular. And it can even be risky. Especially when Jesus adds that second command. And I would have preferred that Jesus just stop right there. Put that period in there. No need to say anymore, Jesus. I'm going to work on the first one. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He makes this equal. As if you can't do one without the other. The second command, love your neighbor as yourself, which is Leviticus 18, 19. And then in the rest of the chapter of Matthew 22, Jesus makes it clear with the parable of the Good Samaritan that neighbor is this broad and all-encompassing category. I like how Eugene Peterson's The Message paraphrases these verses from Matthew. When the Pharisees heard how he had bested the Sadducees, they gathered their forces for an assault. One of their religion scholars spoke for them, posing a question they hoped would show him up. Teacher, which command in God's law is most important? And Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence. This is the most important, the first on any list. But there's a second to set alongside it. Love others as well as you love yourself. These two commandments are pegs. Everything in God's law and the prophets hangs on them. Jesus is boldly clear. Love God and love others, no matter what. Friends, no matter what translation of scripture you use, no matter what paraphrase, it is the exact same. It all boils down to loving God and loving neighbor. And what does that look like for us? Because those are nice words. But what does that look like for us? It means seeing others as God sees them, as a beloved child of God, and then treating them with respect, with compassion, with grace. See, God doesn't see us as rich or poor, as one gender versus other genders as straight or queer, as intelligent or as unschooled. Regardless of what you may have heard in the past few months, God doesn't even see us as red or blue. In God's eyes, we are all purple. We are violet, mauve, boysenberry, lavender, plum, magenta, lilac, periwinkle, iris, heather, 
ameth amethyst, grape, all unique shades of purple. That's the way God sees us as beloved children of God. Shades of purple, not red or blue. And that's what we are in this space as well. Not any sort of label or category that the world likes to use to define us. We are all shades of purple. And so are the saints of all times and of all places that we remember today. They are also shades of purple. Complex and ordinary humans who sought and are seeking to live fully and completely into loving God and loving neighbor. On this holy day, All Saints Sunday, we gather with Christians around the world and remembering the saints in our lives, both past and present. On this day, we gather for a meal of grace with the communion of the saints, as we say in our Apostles' Creed. Hear now that invitation to come forward together.